Hi, it's Mr. G here, and today we're going over 4.2 Supply and Demand in Financial Markets. So like I mentioned in previous videos, this whole chapter is about looking at supply and demand and applying it to different kinds of situations. So in this case, we're applying it to the financial markets to kind of get a better understanding of what's going on there. So if we look at it, we're going to be, uh, first of all, looking at um, savings. Okay, We call that financial capital. In this case, it's going to be the supply. All right, and then we lend out money to other people, businesses, and that is demand. So when we're looking at our graph for this one, the supply line is basically those people who are choosing to save their money. And you gotta remember when you save money in a bank, what happens with the bank? Well, they take that money and they lend it out to other people. So that money is then available for other people to um, borrow. And so financial capital savings, um, you know, essentially what happens is you're saving the money, you lend out to other people, businesses, and that's the demand. So the demand is how much demand is there for loans out there and how much is there for supply. And so if we look at it, we can see, uh, first of all, on the y-axis, we have interest rate or rate of return is um, basically a percentage, so interest rate. And if we look at it, we can see that the demand at about almost 20% is very low. Why? There's not a lot of people out there who want to take out a loan and pay 20% interest per year. Um, that's a lot of interest. And, but the supply is very high. Well, if you think about it, um, you know, if I remember when interest rates were in the double digits, I remember when I was young, I put in money into, um, you know, government securities that essentially I was able to double my money on because the interest rates were so high. I doubled it over, what, eight years or whatever it was. But I was able to do that because the interest rate was fairly high. So a lot of people are willing to save when they see, oh, wow, I can, you know, earn a good rate of return. So they'll do that. Right now, of course, not a great interest rate, so people aren't encouraged to save a lot. Um, but if you look at it, then you know, with a low interest rate, the demand is out there for more people to essentially borrow. More people uh, want to borrow, and if you think about why do they borrow? Businesses borrow because you know they want to maybe expand their business or start a business. Um, so they're going to be expanding the economy this way. Um, if you look at consumers, they will, you know, borrow for houses and other things like that. And so that's where the borrowing comes in. So the lower the interest rate, the more demand there is for this borrowing. And so less people are going to be, you know, buying a new house if the interest rate is really high. They can't afford it. Uh, if the interest rate is really low, then, of course, um, there's going to be more uh, happening. Uh, interesting part, too, with houses is that they typically, because they can afford more, they'll sometimes bid each other up, and so house prices, of course, can go up as well. Uh, so all these things kind of work together. So if we look at uh, the law of demand, um, we can see that a higher interest rate means less borrowing, and a lower interest rate means more borrowing, and that's you know essentially what holds true. Uh, we talk about intertemporal decision making, decisions made over time. Well, people you know don't make decisions just for now; they make decisions for over time. If you think about it, what do people do? They save for retirement. They're like, well, I'm going to retire by 65, so I need to have this amount of money saved up in order to survive or survive uh, off of that money. Um, for people going out of high school, going into post-secondary institutions, they're like, well, you know what? I need to borrow money now. And because I'm at a point in my life, I don't have any money. I need to get through schooling so I can get my jobs that I want. So they're essentially going to be in a state of their life borrowing right now. But they're making decisions for over time, what's going to be happening. And so they're basing their decision on their kind of time of life, etc. And so that's where the decision making is. It's not an instantaneous, like I'm going to the movie now, I'm spending my money now. These are decisions that are going to be, they're thinking over a time period. So that's the intertemporal decision making. So we have a demand shift uh, that can happen. So business confidence, consumer confidence, um, that will affect demand. So we're talking about what things can uh, shift demand. Demand is for how much you borrow. Business confidence, um, you know, if they feel like, you know, their business isn't going to do well, you think about COVID times, uh, they're like, well, we're not sure how things are going. Not a lot of businesses are expanding because they're not sure how things are going to be. Um, so if that's the case, then the demand might shift and decrease. 
um, you know, future receive return. However, if they're like, oh, no, I'm like, you know, things are really going to improve. Um, I have this great idea. Then they'd be more inclined to borrow now. Consumer confidence. If people are uncertain about their job or whatever, they're not as likely to borrow uh, money for their houses, etc. Uh, their ability to repay the loan. Uh, but if they got a great job and everything's going well and they're earning lots of money, they would have more confidence to take out that loan. So that can affect basically demand is about confidence. For supply side, the shift can happen from risk. So everyone looks at other kinds of security. So if um, one specific country's um, interest rate is, you know, not that great and, you know, there's more risk involved, there's usually not a lot of risk with the country. Um, but, you know, certain areas like in Africa or something, you know, some of them would have an inability to pay. And so you have to look at the rate of return versus, you know, the risk factor. So the higher the risk, you know, they're going to look at other securities and say, OK, no, I'd rather be in that. So that can shift the supply. People might not want to lend out. Um, if we look at foreign investment, if, you know, the uh, rising U.S. debt, they might be like, eh, I'm not as sure about the U.S. as a place to store my money. I'm going to store it in other countries because I feel they're a little safer. That would decrease the supply. Decrease the supply, the interest rate has to increase. So that's where the higher the risk, the more the interest rate you have to essentially get in order to be enticed to lend your money there. And so that's why more riskier kinds of things pay higher interest rates. Consumption, people uh, to spend more than save. So you have to also convince people to actually want to save money versus uh, spend money. Uh, a lot of people are like, you know, and things are going well, maybe they want to spend more money and not save as much. So people's consumption, uh, are they going to consume it or save it? And so that can affect basically supply as well. And so these are the different things that will affect supply and demand in the financial market. Um, and just like with anything, you just apply it in um, and you can have surpluses and shortages. And in the end, you should have an equilibrium interest rate uh, that you should be charging uh, where the supply is equal to demand. And of course, this can always change uh, all the time and does change all the time. All right, so that's it for now, okay? Uh, the next video, we will be uh, finishing up with chapter four, and we're just gonna be looking through um, what a, uh, the market system is, an efficient mechanism for information and what that means. All right, bye for now.